This conference will now be recorded. Good evening, everyone. I hope today has been pleasant and treated you well. Um, we here are here to discuss various things relating to sarcoidosis, mental health, and also relating it back to um, coping skills and how to get through such um, difficult things or great ordeals. First, we're going to start with the six steps to a mindful deal with difficult emotions. Now, I think we all can agree at some point in our life with dealing with the sarcoidosis, we tend to have these different emotions, and these emotions um, may be valid. Would you agree? I would say, for one, um, one of the emotions that one may may occur to have is by going to different specialist offices and you're seeing more than one doctor and it can be kind of conflicting when people are saying different things within the medical profession um with that being said let's move forward to the six steps to a mindful deal with um difficult emotions and the first step is I'm just going to enlarge this, so excuse my fingers. The first step would be to turn towards your emotions with acceptance. And pretty much that's self-explanatory. Um, when dealing with your emotions, it's okay to be emotional. We all are human beings. And being able to pinpoint why you're feeling this way will give you your truth and helps you to come to a bridge of a clearer understanding on how did you get to that point, tied into that emotion and being able to identify it. Does that make sense? Yes. Thank you, Brenda. And Brenda, yes. by your response, thank you, Kathleen. By your responses, can you give me an example of how you become um, involved in accepting your emotions or whatever that emotion may be. Uh, for example, um, if you're tired, you're what? Irritable? Things of that nature. Can you relate? I can. Okay. So with that being relatable, Catherine, is it safe to say that you are able to identify and label that emotion because of the irritability is the reason why you're that way? Usually, unless there's other reasons as well. Okay. And Brenda, yourself? I see we have a caller too. Yep, it's Juanita. How you doing? Hello, welcome. <laughs> We was just basically talking about six steps to mindfully um, dealing with difficult emotions. And it's a human thing. We are emotional creatures, especially women. And um, it's okay to, to, to tap into what it is that you're feeling and being able to identify and label what it is um, you're feeling at that present moment. Can you agree? I can agree. I'm terribly miserable at it, but I can agree. And these steps right here will help you to kind of like pinpoint what the issue is and help you through the process of feeling what you're feeling and why you're feeling what you're feeling and how to identify those triggers and what is the best next step for a better outcome. Does that make sense? Makes sense. Okay. So, Kathleen, are we on step three? Is that correct? I'm on my mobile, so it's a little hard to see this. Yeah, it's hard to see here too. So I would think I would think on three. Okay. So we're getting back to accepting your emotions, and your emotions is tied in to you, um, to your physical being on a daily basis. I don't know about you, but my emotions are like a roller coaster. I wake up in the morning, I am grumpy. 
I get up and I tend to my daily needs, which is a full-time um, employment. Why I'm there, you deal with different characteristics throughout the course of the day. So of course, one will be on an emotional roller coaster. Do you get it? Yep. And how you perceive things to be is not always what you perceive things to be. Sometimes you have to look at things um, on a, a wider board, meaning that because someone may have said something to you, it's how you interpret it. And that's how communication needs to be broken down. Basically, it's just asking somebody for clarity on what they said and why did they say it. And with that, your emotions are tied in if you had misinterpreted something that was said and twisted to lean into your own understanding. I hope that's uh, not too vague for you all. I get it. Okay. So with that being said, it's always a good practice too when you're encountering other people and you're having discussions or disagreement to get clarity from that person. Repeat what they say to you back to them and get clarity on what it is that they're actually saying to you versus the tone and how they're saying it. Okay. That's just a helpful temp, uh, tip, sorry. A little congested tonight. So um, we're on step four, thanks Frank, which is realizing um, that emotion and understanding what is going on during the process. And again, we could take this back to us living our daily lives with soccer doises and how it has impacted us emotionally. And I think we all can agree that at some point um, it is a, an emotional roller coaster, along with learning how to accept what it is that you're feeling and how to best move forward. And one of the things with best moving forward is with me, when I feel that I'm an emotional wreck, I take a step back. I don't like to be around people when um, I feel as though um, I'm not at my best. And by meaning that is that if I am not able to really function on a level where um, I'm keeping positivity going and want my reflection to be of a greater light, then I remove myself because I don't want it to be that I'm rubbing off on somebody else, that negative energy. You get it? And sometimes um, being a patient or a person that's, that's ill to this magnitude, you often um, feel as though you're, you're alone. People don't understand you. Um, people don't know how to take you when you say things. And not that you're being grumpy or, or borderline rude. It's just that they don't understand. So sometimes we have to just take a step back and kind of digress from whatever it is that we need to digress from and then step back into place and say, you know, I apologize, but this was what's going on with me at this present time. And it just wasn't a good time for you to pull my coattail to tell me X, Y, and Z. We're all human and we shouldn't be too hard on ourselves. But when you know you get into that boiling point and your temperament has changed because of the energy around you, change your energy. Meaning take a step back, breathe, focus on something that's delightful. Sometimes I like to do crossword puzzles. So what I tend to do is pull one from the side of the bed or even at work when it's time out, if I have to tap out, I have to tap out. And that's what it is at the moment. Just only because I wanna give people the best of me despite of me being ill. Understood? Mm -hmm. Yes. I hope you follow. Thank you, Kathleen, for responding. I um, think most of us are on mute, just so you know. So that there oh, me okay. too. I'm, I'm moving. Okay. It's OK. <laughs> oh, OK. Thanks for explaining that. This is my first presentation, so I'll get better as we go along. Yeah, Does anybody have any questions? That, OK. <laughs> if anybody <laughs> have any questions at this time, feel free to jump in. 
um, as we move along to step six. And step six, oh, did I miss one? Okay, number five was going back to what I just recently said. Um, inquire and, and investigate. Ask yourself what are the triggers that's going on at that present moment and why do you feel that way? And that's a natural thing, so don't think it isn't. These things I think we all can apply within our life and within our walk or wherever we at in our life, we can apply this. And this is just like good points on how to cope with your emotions and not allow yourself to be buried under the covers and be dismissive of everything and woe is me. We shouldn't have that woe is me syndrome. You know why? Because although we're sick, we get to live another day and we get the opportunity to do something right. Rather, if you have to make amends or love on somebody that needs it the most at the present moment, we get to do that and we should be grateful. Okay, we're going into step six. And then after this, I will bring this session to a close and start taking any questions or any um, suggestions on pointers. So um, moving forward, we need to be mindful of how we feel. We need to understand why we're feeling the way we are feeling. We need to come to a quick resolution. Like I said before, with myself, I often can really tap into if it's a negative energy or a positive energy that I'm feeling at the moment. And if it's a negative energy, I remove myself from that space and start focusing on things that are delightful, that kind of cheers me up and make me happy, even looking at my grandkids' pictures or whatever, just so that I can get clarity and understanding and, and, and kind of like uh, deciphering what is actually taking place, how did it take place, why is it taking place, and how to move forward. And these are the steps here, all six steps in regards to dealing with difficult emotions. I know for one, being on different medications can be a trigger. I think we all have in common, if not many, about prednisone and what it does and makes you moody. And I think we all agree to that. And although we can't just step away because this is our reality, but how are you going to cope? How are you going to deal? How do you identify uh, when medications are involved and it's causing you um, these type of dilemmas? Do you confront your nurse, your doctor, and speak to them in regards to how you see a change in your behavior, your attitude in relation to these medications? And what is it that we can do together to kind of work things out so that you're not feeling this way? What do you think? Absolutely, with medications. Anybody else? Well, the medications don't bother me too much because I'm on prednisone. Well, I've been on it for 30 years, but I'm on a small dose now, so they don't mess with my mood. But when I was first diagnosed, yeah, I did. It made my mind feel kind of clipped. And I, mm -hmm. uh, it seemed like I could do uh, ABC and that was it, you know. But so far, that the medication is slimmed down. So oh, after 30 years of pregnancy, I'm like it's probably I'm probably immune to it, you know, to a lot of it. But um, but absolutely, I understand. I can agree with what you're saying, Brenda. I I, I yes. concur with you with the prednisone. Um, to a certain extent, for me, prednisone, um, it's almost like I'm menopausal. <laughs> yes. I, it's like I'm I'm it's I I take everything personally. And mm -hmm. um, and it's not that, and that's what one of the things I was saying to um, um, you all in regards to how you move forward and kind of like deciphering what's really going on, what's taking place. Did I misread into something too much? Mm -hmm. Prednisone, I tell you, for me, although that's the, my drug of choice for my physician for me for this, um, yes. Yes. but emo I'm an emotional roller coaster. Even with gas mm -hmm. I, I that medication, oh my gosh, I feel suicidal and I just, I stopped. I didn't even ask my doctor to, to take me off it. I mm -hmm. stopped 
second bottle. And when I went back in his office, I said, listen, this is not going to work for me. I'm not having good thoughts. Um, mm -hmm. I, 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 just, I can't function and I can't even think straight. Right. I don't know if many of you all have that same experience, but most definitely I, I, I it's relatable to me. So this is. Can you hear me? Sorry. I can hear you. <laughs> oh, thank you. Um, I'm a th I've been on uh, prednisone high dosage for three months, and I can totally relate to the uh, peaks and valleys of it and uh, all the uber emotions that it comes out. And uh, one of the coping mechanisms I have with my wife, who's been a great supporter, is we have a keyword that we use. And, you know, instead of trying to to sort things out, I just say this word, and she looks at me and she knows that I'm I'm dealing with with those peaks and stuff. <laughs> yeah, great job. Definitely something we could all take into consideration as a, a keyword for our family and friends. That is a good idea, and that's yeah. why I'm thinking about it. A key word, yes. Trina, I think the, my worst problem right now, um, and always has been for the, over the past 10 years of sarcoidosis, is every time I get a new diagnosis, one, we start researching, or they want us to start a new medication, we start researching, and then it just kind of piles up. So, you know, like right now, I'm in a multitude of doctors um, for, you know, every part. I've got two neurologists, cardiologists, and uh, a general surgeon that's going on. And it just, you know, it seems to stack and you get you get this weight on your shoulders. You know, um, I, I am very spiritual as well. Most people don't know that. But, you know, it seems like even though I'm handing it over, so to speak, it still weighs really heavy. How could we deal with emotions, you know, not just with medications, but with, um, you know, multiple diagnoses, not knowing what's going on and being scared, point blank. Unmute yourself, Trina. I can't hear you. <laughs> oh, this is so fun. Hi, Trina. Um, hi. <laughs> well, uh, that's a good question that you um, opposed to the platform. And one of the ways that I have dealt with that um, in my walk with my illness, again, like you said, you're diagnosed with more than one thing. You see multiple of doctors and you're going in as a new patient and you're repeating yourself to this doctor, that doctor, I get it. So what I have done to kind of minimize some of that damage, which that's what I call it, that's what it is to me, is A, I need for my physicians to speak with each other prior to me walking into my first appointment. If not the physician, then let the nurse, let her read over the patient notes over to this physician. And if that physician has any questions, if time permits, let the two nurses get back together after they have both spoken with both specialists um, and then get back together as the third wheel of this function to kind of get something going before I walk into that office. Another thing I like to do is get copies of my patient notes from every visit. Mm -hmm. before I walk into the next specialist office. I have like two big binders, I promise you, during the course of the years of going from lab to every surgery, to every medication I've been on, and I have a tendency to hem up that MA or that nurse prior to going into that office, and I give them the whole rundown, and I tell them the key words, what I'm diagnosed with, and <clears> as <throat> today this is where I'm at and if I really don't want to go into further detail the patient's note speaks for itself whatever is pending at that moment that you have questions on that you want to focus on at that visit you get that patient note you make a copy and you mm -hmm. hand it over to the nurse and let her know or him know this is why I'm here today please I want to just discuss this before we move forward okay but it, it's not just that, it's um, also, I see that we have another caller. Okay. Can you see who it is? Right. Um, caller four, are you there? 
This is Juanita. Am I four? I didn't call I, the woman. Oh, we you. got you, Juanita. Is, so that, is, Mary? is that you? Could be me. Hi, Mary. Mary. Did no, you call in or are you on the... Um... No, I'm on the computer. No, so okay. Somebody just joined on the telephone. Oh, no, Who might that? was that? Mary. Was me? Me? No, Mary. Mary. Yes. Now I'm on the computer. Mary came in on the computer. But someone Sorry, did join hey. on the computer. <laughs> All right. Well, okay. we'll... I'll keep I'm a new caller. Hi, new caller. What's your name? Uh, Sue. Sue. Hi, Sue. Welcome. Hi. Welcome, Sue. Thank you. Thank you. So Trina, I understand all that and I, I do all that. So I usually do faxing and stuff like that. So every doctor has it. And actually I've been trying to keep within um, certain groups like Mount Sinai Hospital and stuff like that. So everybody has the connections. But I think what I'm struggling with currently is, um, you know, so you have to go for the EP test and possibly get a defibrillator in the future. And then on top of it, I'm still going for testing for autonomic neuropathy and small fiber neuropathy. And if that's not enough, we still have to work on um, the hiatal hernia because they're saying the esophagus mm -hmm. is bothered by the sarcoidosis. So mm -hmm. it just all comes down at once. How do you get yourself out of that funk or anybody? How do you like kick yourself in the rear end and say, you know what, uh, enough with this, whatever's gonna be is gonna be and just kind of go with it. Well, I would like to interject and say, Catherine, <laughs> focus on one thing at a time. Although there's many different diagnoses, this still you still can have the same outcome. Tackle one thing at a time, get as knowledgeable as you can, as we all know you are, and just move through. Unfortunately, I hate to say it this way, move through the process, but knowing fully that you're still in control. You're your best advocate. So despite of what the doctor says, and I'm just one of them people that I will bump heads with you. If I disagree, if I don't feel that this is the proper treatment or the proper route that we need to be taking, guess what? That's my decision. Just because you have a license, right. I get that part. But you have to understand me as a patient. And if you need a social worker to step in and, and, and see what's the best fit for you, do that. Okay. I'm just wondering how everybody else has dealt with the depression and stuff like that. Anybody yes. else? And relating to um, what Catherine was just um, bringing up, Brenda, relating to uh, uh, the depression and speaking to multiple doctors, how can she best cope with that with different? No, diagnosis? I don't have. I don't have that problem. I have another one, so I was going to name another okay. one. Go for okay. it. Another category. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No problem. Go for it. We'll get back to you, I'll Catherine. Go for it. Okay. What about? Oh, oh. <laughs> what about dealing with emotions socially? Now, myself, I have a chronic cough. So when I go out socially, like I went to church Sunday and I was like kind of hoping I'd get anxious and started going in. And I started feeling myself going into like a cough attack. Mm -hmm. And of course, people are around you and they're kind of scared of coronavirus. Brenda, you're breaking up on us. You're and choppy. And Brenda? It's like that. So I know, I know. I have a problem more socially or just with a I'm playing, I can't even make any plans. So that makes me first. Well, I'm hoping I'm well enough, you know, and that kind of bothers me that I got to make sure I'm not, I can't make any, and nothing's really certain, I guess, the uncertainty of the disease. That kind of emotionally trying to cope with that. And that's the only thing, you know. Does anybody have any problem with, with a chronic cough and how do they cope do. with that? I do. do. And one, one of the oh. things I do, I'm sorry, one of the things I do real quick, you have to know your body temperature. That has a lot to do with indoor mm. air quality. And if you're not in tune with how the temperature within the room is going to act mm. upon you with the coughing spells, I get them to the point where I almost want to pass out. One of the yeah, things I know right. that feel a little moist, I call it moist, but damn, mm -hmm. it almost feel like I feel right. like like a hot flash um mm -hmm. you're finding yourself 
at a point where it's like a stillness in your chest, then you need to remove yourself. Right, you right. don't have to apologize to anybody about what's going on with you. Yeah. They can clearly see. No, I'm not contagious, you know. You. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Because I do sometimes have to explain. Well, I'm not contagious. I'm just clearing my, you know, because you go, I get congested, and then mm -hmm. and that builds a lot of. Because I also have You're bronchiatrosis right. on top of the sarcoidosis. That's something oh. else. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep, so that mom. that bothers me. My mom try to keep a bottle of water. I'm sorry, and that's it. Go ahead, no, Catherine. I agree with you, Trina. Keep a bottle of water first off, especially in the church or social mm. organizations. My mom also had bronchiectasis. Um, oh, really? Uh -huh. Okay. Yeah, it's very unusual. So when you mentioned it, I was like, wow. Okay. So that's yeah. Really my and unfortunately, mm -hmm. she was always coughing. She did a nebulizer like eight times a day. She didn't leave. Yeah, home. you have to do that. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yes. So. Um, you know, she would always say, I'm not contagious, I'm not contagious, but, right, right. you know, in church, they get to know you, and, you know. Yeah, you know. well, everybody in church knows I have sarcoidosis, but, you know, like I'm saying, you're just sitting there, and I went, went to a doctor's office with a friend, I was trying to do a good deed, and took her to the doctor, like, I need to be helping anybody much, but the the place was real congested, and I started going into this crazy cough, and, and I had to get up and hurry up and leave, and get some air outside, and it was just, you know, so that bothers me that I can't, I have to be conscious of all, of all circumstances, even at night, just sleep, I'm coughing, you know. Oh, how's your mother doing? How did she do? I mean, you know. With, she passed you know. last April, but thank oh, you. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. It's you okay. Know? It's okay. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was her time. She was done with the bronchiectasis in life, so mm -hmm. God took her. Uh, right, right. It's all good. <laughs> oh, thank you. I'm glad to. I'm not glad to know she had it, but I'm glad to know that someone knows what I go through. Oh, so Definitely. If you ever need to reach out, thank you. Uh, thank question, you, Brenda. Do you mm -hmm. sleep with your bedroom window a little adjacent? I mean, um, a little open? Just so no. that you can get some flesh or have a ceiling fan going or a fan in the room going? Well, I have that ceiling fan always going. It's been going for okay. 18 years. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, hope, I, 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 I know you're a clean freak, <laughs> but I just want to make sure that sometimes when we're operating those fans, make sure we clean them as often as possible. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Because they can dust, be very dusty. Mm -hmm. yes. Right. Well, it sounds like you're doing oh, all wow. that you can. And again, you have no reason to apologize yeah. when you're out in public. These are one of the things that we go through. And it, I mean, yep. it, it is what it is. Um, just again, just be in tune with yourself. You know you're about to have these coughing spells. Yes. Kind of try to take a mental note of why, and um, be aware of how you feel right prior to that. Uh, getting to that point. Okay. My, be aware of my surroundings. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Right. Because that's probably what the biggest thing that bothers me. It could be um, anything if from you detergent, don't... perfume. It can be anything oh, uh, that triggers off those coughs. So I get it. Mm -hmm. I got a friend that smokes, and she doesn't smoke around me, but I think it's coming out of her clothes or something. Yes, yes, here. Yeah, I don't cough yep. a lot when I'm around her. Yeah. So, um, so carry some for breeze and be like, shh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's what I want to say. Stop smoking, you know. But, you know, um, it, it, speaking back to bronchi bronchiectasis, it's really a person. My body acts like a person that has cystic <laughs> fibrosis. Mm. That's how yeah. you act. You, mucus always in your lungs oh, and it gets know, worse it's worse. really yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's ugly yeah so that's me yeah i've heard that um pineapple juice is good for congestion but that's what i heard yeah but because it's like who is that speaking that's mary yeah. hi hi mary hi so yes yeah, I've heard yes that. i heard that so i mean I, I have no idea if it would help but you know, anything's worth a try, especially if it's not a strong mm -hmm. drug. Okay, I'm going to try that because I did read that that pineapple ha helps a lot. Yeah, they say it's the bromelain in it. So mm -hmm. the bromelain? Oh yes, yes. And that's I take that in an inhaler too. That bromelain. Wow. You know, so yeah, yeah I'm a friend of that inhaler is my best friend. My doctor said so. That's me. Thanks for sharing, Brenda. Anybody else will have any um, further uh, suggestions or any questions that they'd like answered at this point in time? Well, um, just uh, from my point of view, for Brenda, I would 
like I, I always find myself sitting by the door um even like at church uh or i'll be sitting in the back oh, yes. unfortunately um just yeah. knowing that it may happen i'd rather be safe than sorry mm -hmm. it's easier for me to escape than being up front and going excuse me excuse me excuse me um yeah it's just something you know easier and no it's you're also, right you because more, sunday i was sitting in the middle that way too yeah mm -hmm. Right. You're right. I try to sit on the end, but of course, somebody always wants to sit at the end. And <laughs> Sunday I was sitting in the middle and, uh, uh, you know, and, and I'm one of the mothers of the church. So I had to kind of sit. I have to sit on the second or third pew. So it's kind of, you know, it can be kind of uncomfortable. But um, yeah, that's a good idea. I always try to sit at the end if, if possible. Anyone else? So let's oh, Kathleen, move the what were you? I was just gonna ask Kathleen, what were you talking about before this? So I kind of missed it. I was, my my computer was kind of acting up. I was speaking that you know as we go on with sarcoidosis or bronchiectasis or any of our diseases, how you get multiple um, doctors, not just with one thing. So. For instance, you know what I'm kind of going through right now. I've got the heart. I've got two neurologists that I'll be meeting. I still have the hiatal hernia that, that nobody will touch. Me. They say my esophagus. So, you know, you get into a funk, you know, you get become depressed or you just start researching and that's where your life is. You're, you're on the computer on a constant basis and you just get down. You're just like, are you kidding me? And which one do you do first? Mm -hmm. That's the, you know, and then I'm, I'm figuring, ah, you know what, just, wait and see what all the doctors well, say and go from there here's one rule number one that i always fo follow stop mm -hmm. researching <laughs> <laughs> the more That's you easier. look into yeah. the more you look on the internet the more the worse it looks and everything else you i research after the fact <laughs> after they tell me and then you know that that way i know what what it is because when you look on the internet it, it shows you 20 different things it could be. And, oh, no, no, I'm talking um, about after you speak to the doctor. That. I'm talking about like after you speak to the doctor, like the cardiologist with the EP test, and then going from there, either a yeah. monitor or a liberator. And do I want to make another appointment for to do to do it two separates? And I'm like, what the hell? You know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it, I, always, I always tell the doctor, I'm going to do it on my time. Mm -hmm. um, you, you know your body the best. As mm -hmm. much as they tell you, um, you know your body more, better than anybody else. So, so if you want to take two, you want to do it two separate, do it two separate. If you want to get it done now, tell them I want it done now. I mean, it's just, that's the best thing you can do is, you know, I always say, let me, you know, I'm the one who's tired now. Uh, especially when you're in the point where you're at now. And I know where you're at, Kathleen. Um, yeah. Been there. Um, so, yeah. It's to a point where you just, I think you have to, you really have to say, you know, this is where it's going to be on my time because, you know, unless it's to the point where, you know, you have to get it done and they tell you you have to get it done. But if they're giving you choices, then I tell them, I, I always say, respect my opinion. If you're giving me choices, let me make my choice. I mean, yeah. that's just, but I'm pretty blunt anyway. Yeah, it's not all about the choices. It's just, you know, when you seem like everything is coming down on you, your whole body's just falling apart and you're just like, all right, you know what, I'm done. Are you afraid to go to the doctor? Yeah. You don't even want to go to the doctor anymore? Yeah, I, I've been through that lately a lot. You know that. And, but, you know, what I do is I just sit, I, I clear my mind first off. Um, after the doctors, I just clear my mind. Uh, for me, it's easy to uh, find something to get, get your mind off of it. Because, um, you know, that's what, that's what's going to be the worst problem for you is your, is your mind. Yeah. Your mind is going to, you know, weigh much more. So you have to clear it. You got to get your mind, you know, I know it's not going to totally get off of it, but at least give it something else that, you, you know, something else that's, you like to do. do that's it. a good point, Frank. And I, I'm, I'm happy that you had mentioned that because that's putting you in a positive mental state. Mm -hmm. That I have a choice. I have options versus all of these things are coming at me at one time. How can I control them? Think on the other 
term of, okay, I have options, let me weigh them out and let me just take my time so that it can digress one after the other, mm -hmm. if that makes sense, so that you're not feeling emotionally overwhelmed. Right, and that's more where I am at right now. Okay. So, but thank you, everybody. I was just trying to figure out how everybody else has dealt with it. So, I'll okay. divert my <clears throat> my brain somewhere. I wish I was a guy. You know, right. I love you, Frank. But you know what, guys have I don't know. They're they're like this, and I I feel like I hear everything around me, and I'm like, oh God. Kathleen, that that's not strictly true. Um, no? and I say that because <laughs> I've been working um the past couple of weeks with a couple of two or three different guys mm -hmm. um who are faced with uh, pretty serious diagnoses mm -hmm. and um mm -hmm. they handle them in in very different ways these are all men with advanced cancer mm -hmm. and um i was talking to a fellow this morning who i know very well um and he uh he is overwhelmed by his current disease state um, because he can't clearly see what his next treatment is going to be. Mm. And, and, and he, he's done a test. That test is going to give him the direction, but his mind is racing so far ahead that he's discounted whatever that test means in other words he's not staying in the moment mm. and if he could hold himself just to the moment i love what trina said is take one step at a time you know and i know i understand your situation is a little different in that you've got <clears throat> things all happening at the same time so it does make it much harder but in a sense, you have to order which of those are the most important and deal with one at a time and put the others out of your mind until you're ready to deal with the next one, even if it means I've got a doctor's appointment tomorrow for this part of the condition, so I'll just deal with this today. I'm not going to think about anything else. And then tomorrow you'll deal with the next condition. But when you're allowing everything to bombard you at the same time, um, you, you you cannot focus because you're getting distracted. It's so very, a lot of it is creating your own discipline, staying very much in the moment, and focusing on essentially one thing at a time and allowing yourself to do exactly what Trina says. Take it step by step by step. You'll be here tomorrow. You'll be here the next day. You're not going to solve everything in one day. You know what the situation is. Um, and I just think that will help you. And I do think men, um, they do wrestle with this, especially when the diagnosis is bringing the, the mortality even closer, which is what I deal with a lot of times with my guys. They think, oh, I failed this. I'm going to die in, in six months. or I'm going to die in a year. It isn't the case. But the big problem is that when you... When you let it get out, and it's easier said than done, believe me, I, I really do empathize and I understand. But the problem is that you stress your immune system. Well, and then once you stress your immune system, you're making yourself worse. Mm -hmm. so the name of the game is to try and keep as calm as you can so that your immune system can be as strong as it can be. That's my two cents. No, thank you so much for chiming in thank you for that those tidbits greatly appreciated kathleen another way i was looking at it as well is like you know how children they'll play and they run fall and they'll bump yourself or fall down and you play like this sight game with them you hurry up and pick them up and like oh you're okay get back up sometimes <laughs> we have to pep ourselves up to that point you right. know despite of what the diagnosis may be and things can look glim it is up to us. Our mental takes control of everything else. And if your mental is so bogged down with depression and how you're going to pay these bills and so on and so forth, it breaks down all of your immunity. 
take it step by step. Understand that some things are going to be out of our control. Mm -hmm. Control what you can and keep it pushing. Thanks, The Gina. doctors are in place. This mm -hmm. is their job. And our job is to make sure they don't drop the ball. And that's it. That's for sure. Thanks, Trina. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Trina. I, I needed that message. No, it's great. I think we all do. I all, we all do. Yeah. Anybody has anything else they'd like to discuss? Mary and anybody that's on the phone, maybe listening in, will have any questions or want to discuss anything? So this is Sue. And I have a question. I live in the state of Maine, and there's no specialist. So I'm having to go to Massachusetts, but I, I feel like I'm constantly babysitting my doctors here, and I'm not sure who to go to. So it's just been kind of frustrating. We can understand that. And your yeah. question is... And so, so my question is, who do, I, who do I involve to help my doctors? Like, I've just recently been, been having... Um, Somebody else mentioned small fiber neuropathy, and I'm starting to have issues with that. And so my neurologist here cannot help me, but um, my question is, how do I get everybody coordinated? That is, you know, the doctors that I'm seeing, like my, my primary care, my neurologist, and my pulmonologist, how do I get them all coordinated so they can, you know, push me forward? Frank, you like to answer that question? Frank is really great at this. Is he there? Okay, one of the things I oh, would do. Yeah, I'm here. Sorry. Go ahead. My Go camera's ahead. not working for some reason. Take but, charge, uh, please. Um, I, <laughs> the best thing that I can tell you is you you need to pick a point doctor. Um, it could right. be um, whoever you feel more comfortable with, first off. Um, and then um, really talk to that, that doctor and ask that doctor to um if they would you know if they would take all the information in and then you know this way you could discuss it a lot of times you know we, a lot of times it's the pulmonologist because that's where they usually go to but for me actually i mean i have dr morgenthau who is the big the big one but um if it's not him it's usually my primary care and i do that a lot yeah. um i let, let him, um i discuss a lot with more with him than i do with anybody else but yeah, just try to see if you can talk with one of your doctors. It doesn't matter. It doesn't have to be a specific one. Um, just one you feel com more comfortable with, and that you feel knows what you're going through and what talk what you're doing with talkidosis also. Sue? I don't think my primary my primary knows nothing about it. I mean, he's I love him, but I don't feel like he gets it. I think I tell him a lot of symptoms that he's just not familiar with, and and so it kind of goes to a deaf ear. And then my pulmonologist is great, who I love, but he, you know, I'm like, oh, well, I'm going to get a referral to Mass General. And he's like, oh, you don't need to go there. We have neurologists here. And then, you know, I get a referral to a neurologist here in Maine and it's like a, it's a, it falls flat and because they're like, oh, well, you should go here. And it's like, it never, it never moves. So anyway, right now, currently I have a referral to Mass General. So I'm just going to start all over again. And it's like, I just feel like nobody hears me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sue, it's Kathleen. Yeah. Are, have you Hi. been on the foundation for sarcoidosis um, for the physician finder? Because I just found three pulmonologists in Maine, but I don't know if they're close to you. I, I have well, been, yeah, and I've had just my. Say the same thing. Yeah, I have been, and, and I actually like my pulmonologist a lot. And I'm going to see him again in March. But are you seeing somebody in Bangor on the site? And somebody, who are you seeing? What are the names of the doctors? Um, the four that I have is Janskowitz, Alan Janskowitz in Bangor, uh, a Robert yeah. Chavko, also in Bangor, Sigrid Norak, also in Bangor, and Stephen Gorman in Waterville. Yeah, those are all about two hours away. But in any event, that's not the issue. Is I, I look at those with my neurologist and with my pulmonologist and they're like oh well the only difference is, is they've written a paper I'm like what the hell kind of information is that mm. so then it's kind of like oh well they really don't know I guess so I just right. don't, I guess I need to advocate more for myself and just be like you know make more calls and stuff but I don't know I don't know so I just feel kind of, I'm gonna, hmm? 
Go ahead, Susan. Um, um, yeah. One of the things I would like to recommend to you is that when you pick up that phone to make those appointments, find out as much as possible on that call how knowledgeable is that physician with your disease. Right. That's one of the <clears> things before booking an appointment. If you're not happy with your primary, I don't know what type of insurance you have. I, I have always great insurance. Okay, so my thing is, A, divorce them. Divorce them, start And I like off. him so much. I, like, <laughs> I know, I know. I need mm -hmm. somebody who has, like, a handle on it, you know, just. So where? I need some direction. Where in Maine do you live? Portland. What's, what's close? We're, like, two uh, hours gonna... from Boston. Mm -hmm. right. What's so neighboring that? A couple of doctors. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's a couple of doctors here that um, are not just pulmonologists that are from Portland, Maine, sarcoidosis doctors. Really? That you wanna, um, I can, yeah. Um, I'm trying to. She also, uh, I can, she's I'll saying send, he's a neurologist too, Frank. He's a neurologist. Yeah, there's a whole I... bunch of all different doctors. Yeah. I have, I have an internal yeah. medicine. I have um, a family medicine. Neurologist. I have, yeah, I have, I have six pages worth of Portland, Maine doctors that know. Yeah. But it's interesting. Wouldn't you think? Wouldn't you think that one of my doctors would be able, be able to say that? <laughs> mm, yeah. They if should. they're not, if they're not networking with, with amongst each other, then they're not going to yeah. say it. Um, I, I, usually. I mm -hmm. That's the frustrating part. It's like, why don't yeah, they do some research? They why do I they have don't, to? They won't recommend anybody they don't know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But why Just wouldn't like they do point. some research before I come in and say, you know, oh, hey, this was a big concern for you, Sue. I know that you were really upset last time you were here. Let me let me dig my heels in and see what I can come up with. If you really me going there. Uh, Sue, I think another recommendation, too, is see if you can notify the CEO of the, the, of the, the hospital itself. Um, mm -hmm. You can always talk to at least their admin. I have done it. And let them know what you're dissatisfied with and see if they get back with you. Sometimes you have to level up in order for them to come yep. downstairs and meet you at the round table. Because after right. all, our co-pay, our deductibles are paying into- That's what I'm saying. It's like I keep going to see a specialist and I'm getting nothing done, you know? And, and, and I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not meaning to complain. I just wanted to know how you no. all- it's justifiable. Like that, it's, your emotions are justifiable. Um, at the FSR do have on their website, it's like a, what do they call it? A physician protocol, Catherine Frank? Correct. Take that yeah. with you. Uh, Take yeah, but you. on there, I, I was looking. I didn't see any that would help you on, the, on their side, but um, I did do some research on my own just now, mm -hmm. and I found, I found a doctor that's actually... Um, he's a neurologist and he's a child and a regular neurologist, um, sarcoidosis specialist. Um, Stephen Donald, I'm going to have to spell his name, R-I-O-U-X. Yep, Dr. Ryu. Yep. I'm familiar with him, but I didn't know he yeah. was like a specialist. Okay. Yeah, he's actually, he's actually on the main board of, of, huh. Um, he's American Board of Neurology. Hmm. Yeah. There you have and it. Is, so, he with a, is he with, um, a, is wanna, he with a practice group? Uh, is he with a practice group? Uh, Maine, is it Maine Neurology? Uh, I'm trying to say, hold on. Is it 49 Spring Street? <laughs> no, it's not. Uh, no. Oh, yeah, it's, yeah, it's Maine Medical Partner P um, neurology. Is it 49 Spring Street? Partner, 55 Spring. 55 yeah, 55. Spring Street. 55. That's where I go. And I, I just go to a different neurologist. But she's like, oh, we don't have anybody here. We should, you know, maybe re refer you to Mass General. And I'm like, oh, okay. Well, that sucks. Yeah. Well, yeah. He, his name is, I uh, like, even, even wrote Rio. articles about talking about it. Yeah, he even wrote articles I'm calling, about I'm calling tomorrow. Okay, I'm calling tomorrow then, because that really ticks me off. Okay. But thank you for that name. Now yeah, I will so. know. Now I have a name. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
So thanks again. Yeah. And if so, you yeah. ever have any problems, um, do you have my email? No, I don't have anybody's email. I just happened to be All doing right. some research um, and saw that you guys do an online support group. Let me grab a pen now. <laughs> yeah, just let me know when you're ready, and I'll just give you my email really quick. But, but. Yeah. Hang on one second. I'm in the wrong room. Frank is, there, <clears throat> Frank, is there an ambassador in Maine? What's an ambassador? Uh, Bob. Who is it? We have um, we have sarcoidosis ambassador. Bob is Bob Gross. Bob Gross. He's from Maine. Oh yeah, wow. He's in Maine. Mm -hmm. okay, so okay, so maybe connect Frank, the what is your contact? Yes, okay, that would be, um, okay. it's really easy. FJR311 FJR311 at FJR311 mm -hmm. at gmail.com. Okay. But yeah, I will <laughs> also get name? you in touch with the, um, we have it, um, we have national ambassadors throughout the um, United States and when you send mm -hmm. me an email I'm gonna um, send you contact information from the main ambassador okay and so he can awesome. help you out all right perfect mm -hmm. thank you so much okay Might be help. so thank you James I, can, James I just wanted to um, since you're new here can we um, just get a little bit of a background from you James uh, sure. I um, <clears throat> am new to this whole game. I uh, A year ago, I got diagnosed with a lung nodule, <clears throat> and they did a bronchoscopy, and it came up negative, and I thought I was in the clear. But then they discovered I had atrial fibrillation uh, and my resting heart rate, and um, the sarcoidosis, eventually I got the right PET scan, and they figured out it was uh, my heart walls, which is probably causing the AFib. Mm. So I have two things. I have a, an implant now. It's a, a defibrillator because my heart rate was so low, they were worried about it stopping. And the second thing is to go on massive doses of prednisone, which is a life of its own, <laughs> as, as I'm sure you all know. So I've been on this prednisone since November. And um, I feel very lucky that of all the horrible side effects I've read about, I have very few. Uh, you know, mostly the emotions and a little bit of problems with water retention and things like that. But um, uh, it, you know, it's one of those things that I've said to myself: this is what I need to do. You know, it interferes with my athletic pursuits and everything else. But hopefully the outcome is good. Uh, one final note. Last week I had a CAT scan on my lung, and the nodule was gone, and my lungs were clear. So something's going right. <laughs> that's great. Yeah, so that's that's my uh, brief. Any questions about that? or? No. Unfortunately, welcome to the group. Yeah. <laughs> well, I have a friend who has another rare autoimmune disease, and she talked up the uh, support groups that she um, uses that really helped her. And so I found you guys, and uh, it just happened to be the first Tuesday of the month. So I was really happy to join you today. This is really good stuff. Thank you. Thank you. And for joining. I'm, I'm retired, so I don't have to go to work and bear all of this. Oh, that's nice. I have seven more years. I'm pushing. <laughs> Well, thank well, you. It's interesting. Your story is interesting. Thank you for sharing about um, the, the AFib and, and what you went through and the findings of the, the, is it, you said the muscle of the heart or the heart walls? It, it's the heart walls. And, you know, they communicate from the upper chamber to the lower chamber uh, through the heart walls. That's where your signals go. And when that's they get messed up, that's when you have atrial fibrillation. <clears throat> They have hmm. processes to fix that with people. They call that an ablation. But in my case, I'm hoping, well, I'm hoping that it's the sarcoidosis, the inflammation, that when it goes away, that I'll get my signals back again and I won't have to have any heart operations or anything like that. Well, are they able to uh, detect if they're scarring? Uh, of the heart walls? 
Uh, no, but they did find uh, that I had sarcoidosis on my heart walls. That was hmm. part of the, the PET scan. Yeah, yeah they, they do a PET scan, which puts radioactive fluid in your system. And apparently my heart rate, uh, my heart walls lit up with all of the glucose. Which, oh. means, which means the disease was there. Mm -hmm. And as you all know, it, it it ended up in my rib and my hip and other places as well. So mm -hmm. interesting. Yeah, I've learned a lot. <laughs> yeah. Science is, is amazing. The things that they can do, the technology that they keep coming out with. Oh, boy, I, I wish they would get a 10-year a, a advance like right now so we, we'll know how to best move forward with this disease, I tell you. So I just want to make a comment about the other discussions you've had about doctors talking to each other. I'm out yes. in California in, in a HMO called Kaiser Permanente, which is huge. And I have to say that my three doctors, a pulmonologist, a, um, a uh, uh, I'm sorry, uh, I always forget, uh, what is it? The, uh, sorry? Cardiologist. Oh, a cardiologist, the second one, and the third one is the rheumatologist. That's what I couldn't remember. Mm -hmm. um, they really went to town talking to each other about what to do. Um, mm -hmm. It was such a collaborative effort on those guys. And, you know, at some point, I could totally relate to that. Who do I talk to? Who's in charge? You know, right. uh, but when I, talk, when I talk to one of the doctors, they say, well, we talked to the other two, and here's what we think. And that is so reassuring. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if you can force that. Uh, I just happen to be lucky that they did, they did that by default. But, you know, it's a piece of advice is to is to say, would you mind consulting with the other doctors to make sure that uh, you've covered all of the, the different aspects of this? And I, I know that that's a tough thing to do between different carriers and whatnot, but it's just an idea. It really made sure, the difference. I appreciate that. Yeah. It does. Thank you. It really does. Point well taken. Yeah. That's it. This is Susan. Juanita. Juanita, yes, hi. Yeah, I'm jumping in. Kaiser, it's interesting you said you had, Kaiser's been good for you because I have had pretty much the opposite um, uh, situation here in um, the Washington metropolitan area. I just got them to acknowledge that, I, you know, my nutritionist knows absolutely nothing about what to do with soccer doses. So pretty much I've been feeling around with that. My pulmonologist, every time there was a problem, they just went to my pulmonologist. And my pulmonologist is really only interested in my lungs. So if my lungs are clear, I'm in remission. She doesn't care. I mean, not that she doesn't care, but she doesn't see any, any reason to get, to get fat. I finally complained enough to my doctor, and he said, I'm going to write down you have pains in your knees and you need to see the rheumatologist. And that's how I ended up there with the rheumatologist, who then jumped in and said, here are all the things, you know, you've had poor test results in different areas, but, and we, you've assumed it's the medication, but has anybody actually checked the organs? They may be the reason why you're showing weird um, test results. And so we're on that journey right now. And I find myself just struggling to get, to just get Kaiser to hear me. I live in the, you know, I live close to Baltimore, John Hopkins, University of Maryland. It's an hour and a half drive to Pennsylvania, all of which have great soccer doses clinics. And Kaiser's jealously saying, we don't think you should go there. And um, so I'm struggling with that. The big struggle I'm having right now is um, my kidney. I keep getting kidney stones. And I can't find who to go to in um, Kaiser. What I want is a diet regimen that agrees, or at least tells me what I can eat. Right now, I think I can eat cat, baby cat. That's it. Um, mm. And that's the struggle right now. You know, there are a lot of things that you should limit intake on with kidney stones, and they're all things I like to eat, and they're all the healthy things for most people. Um, and then there's sarcoidosis, which I have modified one of the diets I got from um, 
from uh, University of Maryland online. So no chocolate, no dairy, no gluten. Um, and no something else, but I can't remember what it is. And I okay. wonder if anybody else has had that situation. Well, I don't know much about Kaiser, but I do know that Kaiser is a, a facility that's held with multiple specialists within their walls. So I'm really kind of surprised to hear that uh, you have not been um, referred to, what is it, urology? Because of the kidney, is that correct? Yeah, that was urology, yeah. Okay. And they found so, my kidney stones when they were looking at my lungs. So. And and I think we get we get that we get the full picture on that. Um, and I can yeah. see why the the pulmonologist is like it's backing off because basically that's what they specialize in. And really, you need a primary physician that's going to a um, advocate for you and help you find best solutions on how to get something resolved or something looked at immediately, especially with having this disease. So I, my other uh, suggestion to you would be have a second opinion for a primary. You might have to drop the first one and go to another one that you feel most comfortable with that's listening to you. Yeah. I'm feeling much better now that I found a rheumatologist, but we've only been together, so to speak, for two weeks now. So I'll give her a, a chance. And the, and the great thing primary about Kaza is that everything is in-house. Like really not so much yeah. a referral, you know, that's a good thing. Right. Mm -hmm. The other thing I was going to say is um, if you're dealing with your kidneys, don't forget about an endocrinologist, too. Oh, yeah, <laughs> that helps. <laughs> Thank you. The yeah, one thing that was, yeah. uh, Rick, Hi, Helen. Hi. Um, was that I get an internal medicine doctor to be my primary care over a normal primary care doctor. But I'm not having much luck finding an uh, internal medicine doctor here in Fort Wayne that has sarcoidosis mm -hmm. knowledge. So, but at least I've talked to a couple now that seem to be interested in understanding at least to a level that they can help point me in the right directions. Mm -hmm. And we've run across that a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm sorry. I'm going to look her up also um, for her, for okay. you. For um, there are a couple of in, um, internal medicine doctors over in Fort Wayne because I remember I had to find a doctor for somebody else. So let me give me a couple of minutes. I will look it up for you. Oh, I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. As far as the person who's near Baltimore, can you get to John Hopkins, or does Kaiser not let you go there? Kaiser has not given me a referral for there, and I keep asking for it. And I told him every time somebody couldn't respond to my issue, I would I would ask again. Um, and so right now, I'm you know I'm working with the rheumatologist, and she's the first person who seems to understand what I'm going through. Everybody else is like, yeah, I saw sarcoidosis on your chart, and then they move on, except for my eye doctor because I have sarcoidosis, and I've had issues with them in both eyes. And they take it seriously. So it's a little bit of everything. I've just started at John Hopkins um, going there. And so far, so good. But I'm new to the area. Right. You will have to keep in touch and you can tell me how it's working. Yeah, absolutely. Anybody else has any questions or any input? Well, um, FSR is always a great source. If you have an opportunity to Google the, uh, the foundation, they have different resources within their website that can either direct you or source you out to what um, you may possibly need as far as uh, physician care, or um, some type of guide to help that physician to learn how to treat you properly. I know for myself, um, prior to me um, working full time, I was on um, Georgia State Medicaid. And um, the primary I had for years, even when I started working and had gotten private insurance, 
even himself was baffled. And you'll find a lot of times, a lot of primaries, internalists, whatever you like to call them, what they specialize in, are not as knowledgeable as you are when it comes to stock choices. So just keep that in mind. And referring back to the FSR on their website, the information that they share with us in regards to a physician protocol on how to treat or next steps testing um, is on their site. And if you could just grab a copy of that, print it out and take it with you to help um, during your frustrations with getting the proper treatment, it could be most useful that way as well. Yeah, I think like one of the things that for me, for the, the route that my experience has been is like when you first find out you have sarcoidosis, it's everything. You learn everything you can and and you're just like, oh my God. And you want everyone to know and you expect like your doctors to know about this and, and they don't. And then the more I've learned and then over time realizing that there's over 7,000 rare diseases, it's impossible for the physicians to be aware of all of these diseases and how to deal with them. What I have been fortunate with is that I've had doctors whose egos weren't so big that mm -hmm. they basically said, let me send you to somebody who knows more. And that's the ideal situation. Because when you're in your own little bubble of the world of sarcoidosis, you're like, they should have all my answers. But <laughs> a lot of them don't. It's impossible for them. So, But, you know, ask them for referrals. Ask them to lead you. You know, give them the information you have and say, can you... Can you help guide me where to go next? Absolutely, Mary. Absolutely correct. Um, I had those experiences as you was just explaining and expressing to us. Um, we're trying to get physicians to either hear you or to treat you properly. And it's a it's a it's a partnership. It really is. Um, we can't walk in there relying totally and completely on them on what's best for us, but we do have an expectancy that they should know something. And right. I stand on that. And I, I, I advise you to stand on that too, because anytime you walk into an office and your expectations is just mainly, this is the office's responsibility. Um, I don't suggest that's healthy. A, I firmly believe that we all should advocate to some degree. And if you don't know Let's pair up as a team. Let's get this done together. Let's put in the work so that um, our mortality rate is not as high, you know, and that uh, we are each other's brothers, brothers, sisters, and uh, keepers. So let's just let's keep it on that note. And I know we're about short on time. Somebody else wants to express something. Go ahead, please. Yeah. Susie, no, Kathleen, you're back, yay. I, I've been around, it. I'm sorry, it's, I had dogs barking and phones ringing and, anyway. Understood. Well, we are about to bring this to a close. If anybody else has any other suggestions, questions, some things you would like to talk about in the near, uh, coming up meetings, feel free to uh, write in and or plug in with Frank or Kathleen or anybody here. One of the members send your questions beforehand if you like to kind of stay on task and we'll be happy and most obliged to accept those feedbacks and move it forward. Other than that, we're going to top off the night and say have a great evening. Uh, rest well, drink plenty of water, and always digress from stress. Nice. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good night. Helen, thank you all. Good night. Helen, before you leave, good night. Good night. Are you on the Facebook page? Who, what? Helen, are you on the um, Facebook page that we have here? Maybe she left. I don't know. No, she's still showing. Yeah. Helen? Sorry, I'm here. I thank was you. talking. I was muted. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. Are you yeah, on I'm the on Facebook? Okay. Yeah, I'm on the Facebook page. I'm also you also have my email. Okay, so what I'll do is I'm gonna um I'll email you back with the information that I, I get I find out for you, okay? Okay, I appreciate it. Thank you. All right, thank you. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye bye. Good night. Thank, thank you, night. Chair. All be well. Thank you, Trina. Great Adios. job, Trina. Bye. Oh,